Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our longer look at the lessons. Today, we're taking a longer look at our appointed gospel lesson for this Sunday, January 24th, 2021. Uh, this is the third Sunday after the Epiphany, and the appointed gospel lesson is from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Uh, the Bible study that we have here is going to dive into the text pretty quick. So uh, let me go ahead and read this text for us, and then, uh, and then we'll discuss it in, in more detail. So as always, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, which is the same version of the Bible that we read from uh, every Sunday here at Mount Calvary in our worship service. If you're reading from a different version, it may sound a little bit different. Um, but uh, the gist should pretty much be the same. Also, let me encourage you, if you're reading from a different translation, and uh, feel free to share that with the people that you're gathered with. Um, sometimes a different translation or a different way of interpreting something can open up understanding and help you to uh, understand what God's Word is trying to say to you uh, through a particular passage or text. So if it says something different and that seems like it's uh, important, uh, feel free to share. This is not the... This is not the authoritative version. It's just the version that we're using right now. So with that being said, let's go ahead and, and uh, let me read the text for us. This is again Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Thus far the text. So we'll take a look at our Bible study now. Mark, in his hurried newspaper style, did not devote much time to the background. In the first 13 verses of his gospel, he quickly told of the ministry of John the Baptist, the baptism of Jesus, and Jesus' testing by the devil in the desert. Then he moved immediately into an account of the ministry of Jesus, an account that emphasizes that Jesus did more than what he said. A favorite word of Mark was oithus, translated immediately, or at once, or without, one, or without delay. In one sentence, Mark told the end of John's ministry and the beginning of Jesus' ministry and even gave a summary proclamation. That summary proclamation that he's talking about is in uh, John chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 14 and 15. Verse 15, mostly, when Jesus has something to say. So looking at John 1, 15, go ahead and pause the video and take a look at question 174 and discuss it. And then uh, I'll come back and give you some insight. Question 174. What three elements do you find in this summary of Jesus' proclamation? So there are three parts to uh, what I believe is the first quote of Jesus in Mark's gospel. And there's three parts to it. Uh, we're going to explore these parts in more depth in the, in the next part of our Bible study. But it's important for us to identify what those three parts are. And you may have gotten tripped up with thinking that there were four and not three. So Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And so, for those of you that are uh, still grammar proficient, you know that there are four verbs in there, and good on you for finding those four verbs. The time is fulfilled, passive version of that. The kingdom of God is at hand, it is near, that's the second one. Repent would be the third verb, and believe would be the fourth. So why are we saying that there's only three elements to this? Aha, it's because repent and believe must go together, uh, as we will talk about in uh, in the next part of our Bible study in one of the uh, in one of the questions coming up. But I'll give away a little secret: repent and believe must always go together. If they ever get separated, you no longer have the Christian faith. So repent and believe have to go together. So that's our three elements. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Okay? So with this in mind, let's continue on to the next long paragraph in our, in our handout. 
The Greek word kairos speaks of an appropriate time or an opportune time. Okay, so kairos, this is the, one of the great things about Greek. Greek, is, uh, Greek has a lot of different words. A lot, I think, I won't say it has more words than English. Um, but it certainly is more prolific and more pointed in its use. So there are, there are two main words in Greek that are translated as time. And each of them has a, a, a different sense of that time. This word kairos that they bring up here, this is a, a, a specific time, a, uh, an appointed time, uh, an appropriate time, an opportune time, as, the, as, this, as this writer says here. Uh, it's a specific time. Uh, the time is at hand. The other word for time is you're very familiar with. It's it's chronos. Uh, a chronograph is another is a fancy name for a watch. So you know if you buy your buy your thirty dollar Timex, it's a watch. But if you buy a three thousand dollar Rolex, Rolex, it's not a it's not a watch. It's a chronograph. Um, uh, two Greek words. Graph means to write, and time and chronos means time. It's something that shows you the time. It writes the time before you. All right. Um, this is why I'm good at Jeopardy, by the way, is I can pick words apart like that um, because of my study of Greek. Um, I got to get on that show. Anyway, um, so Kronos is that more, you know, is that more flow of time. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not as precise. It's not as specific, uh, but it talks more about the flow of time, whereas Kairos talks about an, a, a, a definite time. Um, chrono, just a, 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 just trying to think of a better uh, metaphor here off the top of my head. You know, we might talk about the chronos of a flowing day as opposed to the kairos of an appointment during that day. Uh, you know, you ask uh, um, uh, maybe if, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe your husband goes away on a guy's weekend or your wife goes away on a girl's weekend and you say, did you have a good time? You're not asking for necessarily... You're not asking for what specifically was the best thing that you did, but overall was that time that you spent away enjoyable? Um, that time that you spent away, was that enjoyable? Was you, Did you have a good chronos? Oh, you did. Uh-huh. Well, what did you do that was fun? What was a particular kairos that was fun? All right. So just that's what that's about. Let's carry on. The kingdom of God that Jesus proclaimed is not a place. It is his rule in the lives of men and women. Okay, so when we hear the word kingdom, we think of, you know, uh, we think of fairy tales. Uh, we think of a, of a prince who lived in a far off kingdom, or we think of a, uh, we, we think of a princess who lived in a, a, uh, a far off kingdom. And she was very beautiful. And, uh, you know, and so we think about kingdoms in that way. Um, but kingdom is actually better translated as, uh, as, um, well, like an administration. We just celebrated another inauguration uh, of, of another president here. And so uh, uh, for the 44th, no, for the 45th time in our nation's history, we peacefully transferred power from one man to another and appointed a new extreme executive uh, to, to lead us uh, politically. And, uh, and so now we, we have, with that inauguration, we have the end of the Trump administration and the beginning of the Biden administration. Do not break down into talking about politics between those two. Uh, that's not the point that I'm trying to make. One is not bad. One is not good. Uh, they are different. Uh, the way that President Trump as a Republican ran his administration is vastly different from the way that Joe Biden as a Democrat will run his administration. Um, it, at the time that I'm recording this video, we're already talking about all the executive orders that President Biden has signed to set the priorities and policies and procedures of his administration, of his kingdom. He's not a king, but that word that we translate as kingdom is administration, how something works. What are the priorities? What are the policies? What are the, uh, what are the, the passions of that administration? And so what, what Jesus is saying here when he says the kingdom of God is at hand is he's saying, look, God's administration is coming into power. This is the inauguration of God's administration and how he does things. It is not an earthly administration. It is not concerned with the rule of the Romans. It is not concerned with the things that we have going on in our nation. That's not the primary concern of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is concerned with the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting as we confess in the Apostles' Creed 
and in the Nicene Creed. That's what it's concerned with. It's concerned with eternal things and not temporal things. Jesus comes to proclaim the eternal kingdom and not to proclaim some kind of earthly kingdom. There were a lot of people that wanted him to proclaim an earthly kingdom. There were a lot of people that wanted Jesus to raise up an army and physically throw the Romans out of Jerusalem and to reestablish the kingdom of David uh, and to expand its borders and even to conquer the world. That's not what he's here for. That day will come. It's not yet, but that day will come. Um, but right now, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom that is concerned with the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That's the kingdom that is starting. All right, carrying on again. When that rule confronts us as at the appropriate time in God's plan, it becomes the opportune time for us. Metanoiate, repent, called for a change of heart and mind that influences one's whole direction in life. Pistoiate, believe, involves more than intellectual acceptance of a fact. It calls for a relationship of confidence and trust. Both are imperatives in the present tense, which in Greek calls for continuing action. Keep on repenting and keep on believing in the kairos that God gives us. Okay, so again, the writer of the Bible study brought up this, this idea from Greek grammar. And it's, this is one of the reasons why they re, we require seminarians to study the original languages is to get this idea. When Jesus says repent and believe, he means that it is an ongoing thing. He could have used this in, in a different tense, in what is called the aorist tense. And in the aorist tense, uh, aorist tense when, uh, when God says to do something, it's a one and done. So when, in the aorist tense, when he says, if he would have said these in, in aorist, it would have meant repent once, believe once. One and done. That's it. Um, uh, you know, I was thinking about this earlier, and a great way to think about this is with the imperative, close the door. Uh, if you have children at home, or if you remember what it was like to have children at home, that was something you probably had to say time and time again. Close the door. Close the door. And every time you said it, it was a one-time thing. Uh, it, was, it was close the door. And then you would close the door, the latch would catch, the door would stay closed until the kids went in and out, and then the door would pop open. And then you could feel like you were saying, keep on closing the door. That may feel like what you're talking about, but actually, in actuality, when you close the door, the door could stay closed. Um, unless there was a problem with the door, right? If the latch isn't working, then, then yeah, you do have to keep on closing the door. If, uh, you know, if your door faces to the south and the latch isn't working and there's a wind coming out of the south, you might close the door and the wind will blow it open and you close the door and the wind will blow it open. And so, yeah, you'll have to keep on closing the door, which looks like probably closing the door and putting your hand on it until you can get something to shim it closed or, or uh, hold, you know, or until you can get the tools to fix it properly, of course. Um, but that's different. It's different, even though you have to repeat the action over and over, um, uh, you can do it and it's done. Repentance and belief is not something that you can do and it's done. It's not like closing the door. It has to constantly go on. Luther describes this beautifully in the fourth part of his teaching on baptism in the small catechism when he says daily uh, we, have to, we have to drown the old Adam in our baptism. We have to continually repent by taking that old person that we are and drowning him in our baptism so that daily the new man can arise. So that daily who, who God wants us to be in Jesus Christ can come, can come alive. This is a daily process. It has to keep on happening. It's not just something you can do once and then it's done. You can't just repent once and pray a special prayer and then be a believer forever. That's not how it works. You have to keep on repenting and keep on believing, uh, as Jesus says here. Okay, enough Greek for today. Go ahead and pause the video and take a look at the next few questions. Uh, questions 175 through question 178 uh, on the next page. So go ahead and, uh, and uh, take some time, discuss those questions. We'll come back and I'll share some of my thoughts with you in just a few moments. Welcome back. Let's take a look at our questions now together now, shall we? Uh, question 175. What did Jesus, the time is fulfilled, say to people to whom he was preaching? And what does it say to you for your life? 
So for the people in the past that, that uh, the time is fulfilled, that told them this is it. Um, we, oh, who did we look at? Ah, when we were looking at the, well, just last week, when we were talking about Nathaniel and how Nathaniel was probably one of those faithful remnant of Israel, one of those people that was waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Um, and Jesus came and, and, and explained to him that he was the fulfillment, that he was what he was looking for. Okay, this is the appointed time. This is the time of the fulfillment. That thing that you have been waiting for, this is it. It's, uh, you know, uh, like uh, children during Advent and Christmas. If, if, if you have an Advent calendar, you, you, open the, you open the doors. Sarah and I have an Advent nativity that I love. It's one of, my, it's one of our favorite things. Uh, that we have at Christmas time, and so every day we take a different figure and we put it on, and slowly the manger is getting full, getting filled, and finally on the 25th, we take the Christ child out and we put the Christ child uh, in the manger, or the, the Christ child's in the manger, but we put him in the nativity. Uh, that's the day. This is it. This is the time. And uh, while uh, while most of the disciples didn't realize how special Jesus was when he was born, they do now realize that there is something very special about him. And so Jesus confirms that. Um, the time is fulfilled. This is it. This is the appointed time. This is the fulfilled time. God on his divine calendar had an appointment, and today is the day. So what does that mean for us today? Uh, now that we live after these events, after we, we live after not just Jesus calling the apostles, uh, but also uh, dying, rising again, ascending into heaven, giving them the mission, playing our part in carrying out that mission. What does that mean for us? It means the same thing. Today's the day. Today is a new day. But today's the day. Today is the day to get serious about your relationship with Jesus. Today is the day to take what he says seriously. Today is the day to, um, to take his message to heart and to believe it and to act on it and to change your life around it. Um, that, that time is now. That day is today. Um, we're sitting here in the middle of the, the, se the season after Epiphany. Um, uh, Ash Wednesday is less than a month away, and for a lot of us, we think, hmm, Ash Wednesday, it's the beginning of Lent. What, what changes should I make for Lent? And we start to think about, I should maybe, you know, maybe I should be more faithful in my Bible reading. Yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll wait till Ash Wednesday to be more faithful in my Bible reading. If that's what you're saying to yourself right now, what Jesus would say is the time is fulfilled. Today is the day. Do it today. The time to be more faithful in your Bible reading is today. Go home. Pull your scripture off your bookshelf. Take it off the coffee table. Wherever it is that it is laying, put it on your lap and read it. Do it today. Today is the day to get serious about your relationship with Jesus. Don't wait for Ash Wednesday. Don't wait for Easter. Don't wait for New Year's of 2022. Don't wait until the kids are, are, are older. Don't wait until, uh, don't wait until COVID is over. Don't wait until, don't wait. The time is fulfilled. Now is the time. Do it now. All right. Question 176. What did Jesus, the kingdom of God is at hand? Say to people to whom say to the people who to whom he was preaching, and what does it say to your life? Okay, so back then, back then it had a wonderful meaning because it meant that the king was before them, that the the supreme authority in in all of uh, in in all of creation was there, and his administration was coming to pass. He was doing the things that he wanted to do. He was doing the things that he came to do. So back then it was the good news that the king of the universe now stands before you in, in human flesh. Um, but now it means that God's gracious rule is warm and personal. It means that the kingdom of God is here. That those things that we talked about just a few short moments ago, that the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting, those things are here and now. They're not just things that we, that we get when we die. They're things that we have now. 
um, we will live forever. But pastor, we will die. The scriptures talk often about falling asleep. It's not the end. We will live forever. Um, that is our gift now through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is at hand. The good news that we share with people is that this kingdom is at hand for them. That they have forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, life everlasting. The forgiveness of sins is not something that is conditional about, uh, upon whether or not someone believes. It's there. It's given. It's that Jesus died for the sins of all. He gave his life for everyone's sins. The sad thing is, is that there's just some people who who don't choose, who choose not to believe it. Um, a, a, a bit of an example, a weird one. This and it, this may not totally apply, um, but you know there were uh, over the last year there have been people who have gotten checks from the government as stimulus checks. And they've gotten this thing in the mail that says, hey, the, your government wants to give you some money to help you get through this time. And um, sadly, there were probably some people who didn't believe it. There were probably some people who said, you know, I don't, this doesn't look right. This doesn't look right. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to cash this. It doesn't look right. I can't believe it. I can't believe that my government would send me money. I'm not going to, I'm not going to cash it. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not, does it, doesn't change the fact that that check is worth whatever whatever that stimulus money was worth, the 600 or 1200 or whatever it was. It doesn't mean that it doesn't still have value. It doesn't mean that somewhere in the register of our, of our United States Treasury that there is a, a check to John Doe that will never get cashed um, because somebody doesn't believe it. It doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that there are resources set against that check so that if John Doe would go to his bank and sign his name, he would have... The benefits of that. And that's very much how salvation works. When we're doing evangelism, we're not inviting people. This isn't conditional. This isn't saying, if you believe in Jesus, he will forgive your sins. It's going to people and saying, look, you have a check. You have a check that is good for the forgiveness of all of your sins. You have a check that is good for the resurrection of your body when you die. You have a check that is good to give you the assurance of life everlasting with your Savior uh, in a new heaven and a new earth forever and ever. Amen. It's what you have. It's yours. I, I'm here to explain to you how this is already yours. We're not selling anything. We're helping people to understand the gift that has already been given and the gift that is already theirs. That's what um, that's what it means when we say that the kingdom of God is at hand. It's already given. And our work then is to share that message of what has been given for someone. Um, there are some people that have a hard time believing this. And yeah, I've, I've, I've met those folks too. Um, uh, but that doesn't change the fact that it is given. Just because somebody disbelieves the gospel doesn't mean that Jesus uh, didn't die for them. So then, Pastor, why aren't all people saved? Because God and his mystery allows people to go whatever way they want to go. Um, C.S. Lewis wrote a little book that we read in seminary, and I, I've read it a couple times since. It's called The Great Divorce, and it's a little bit of a, uh, it's, Lewis, it's, it's Lewis's uh, interpretation of what, what will happen when we die. Uh, it's a fictitious interpretation. Uh, there are little grains of truth in it, and, and in it, he kind of gives his opinion. And one of the opinions that C.S. Lewis has that I kind of agree with is he says that um, he says that even if you even if you gave people who are in hell now, even if you gave them a choice um, to to uh, in, in Lewis's story, there's a bus that goes between heaven and hell. And he says, even if you gave the people in hell a chance to get on the bus and go to heaven, they wouldn't take it because they don't believe it. And, and so Lewis's character says, so that means they can't get on the bus. And, and, and his guide says, no, they can get on the bus, but they choose not to because they don't believe it. Um, that's, that's where we are. Uh, salvation is open to anyone who chooses to believe it. Um, and sadly, there's a lot of people to whom this idea sounds too good to be true, or they're waiting for a more opportune time. Uh, they're waiting for a better time. Uh, they're waiting for a time to be fulfilled. Uh, they're saying to themselves, well, I want to live a, a life filled with, 
with uh, you know wine, women, and strong. Today I want to eat, drink, and be merry, and then uh, and then I'll take care of that later. But the problem is, is that you can eat, drink, and be merry, but what happens if tomorrow you die? Uh, we have to understand uh, that the time is limited. The time is now for everyone to understand the gift that has been given through God's gracious kingdom. Okay, so that's what it means for us today. It means that our job as the Christian church is to go and tell people the gift that has already been given to them by Jesus Christ through his death and resurrection. That's, that's what we do. All right. Question 177. What did Jesus, quote, keep on repenting and believing the gospel, say to people to whom he was, to whom he was preaching? Excuse me. What does it say for your life? So then it was a pointed message urging and enabling salvation. For them, it was, uh, for them, for back then, it was, it was a, a call for them to sort of open their minds and to understand what he was doing, to see what he was doing, to understand what he was teaching, and to believe in the gifts that he was giving. Uh, and now, still today, keep on means that this is a re regular daily activity. We talked about that already. We are to keep on repenting and believing. As we keep on repenting, that repentance will produce a fruit that is confession. And so we are, we are regular in our confession of sins, um, whether that's through public confession uh, in the worship service or privately confessing your sins, whatever that looks like. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. It's something that we always do. We are always mindful um, that we, uh, we are always mindful that we have not done what the Lord has asked us to do. The good that we have, uh, um, um, we've sinned against God, and it, we've sinned in thought, word, and deed um, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved God with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We, we will always confess this. Whether we have a good week or a bad week, we will keep on confessing this and reminding ourselves that we are not perfect. Not because we're striving to be perfect. We are in a sense, but that's not the goal of confession. The goal of confession is more importantly to remind us of God's grace for those times when we aren't perfect. Um, if, you lived, uh, if, you, if we were to take the week that you lived this week and put it on a scale from 1 to 10, 1 being just atrocious and 10 being uh, just like Jesus, the, God's forgiveness is the same if you had a 7 week or if you had a 2 week. It doesn't matter. The, the forgiveness is still the same. We, are ne we will never be so bad that we are outside God's grace. And we will never be so good that we don't need God's grace. Uh, and that's, that's why we keep on repenting and keep on believing. This raises another question, too, that some of you might be asking, and that is, can a person, because I explained at the beginning that repentance and belief, they have to go together. And so maybe you're asking, can you have repentance without having belief, or can you have belief without having repentance? And the answer is yes, but when you do that, you don't understand them fully. Um, I know a lot of people who, uh, who repent uh, without belief. Um, my my uh, first assignment as a chaplain in the military was to a basic training uh, uh, group. And you didn't just minister to the young men who came through every 13 weeks and who were, uh, who were training to be uh, soldiers and, and then moving out. That was part of, you know, that was the majority of my job. But there was also, not even the majority, that was 50% of my job. The other 50% of my job was dealing with, uh, with, the, with the, the drill sergeants, um, the officers, the staff, the other people that were there that it was our job to train them. Um, some of these guys, uh, when I was there in, in May, of two, May of 2004 till May of 2007, a lot of them were coming back from war. Uh, a, lot of them had, a lot of them had been in combat in Iraq, and they got home, and, uh, and their next assignment was to take some of the lessons they had learned on the battlefields and teach them in basic training, some of the discipline that soldiers needed uh, to be so successful in that battlefield. And they were asked to do some terrible things. They went to war. Uh, the infantry jokes and they say that their main job is to kill people and break things. But uh, the reason that God gives us the sixth commandment is because he knows how our psyches are wired. And he knows that it's very difficult for one man to take another man's life. That it, uh, that it can be very damaging sometimes. And there were a lot of these drill sergeants and a lot of these other officers who had come back from a battlefield. And 
uh, they were um, they had come back from the battlefield and uh, they were repentant. They were sorry for some of the things that they had done. Uh, they felt remorse for having to do those things that they had trained for years to do. Uh, and so when I would go to them and, and try to extend to them the gospel, uh, I would often hear from them, Pastor, if God knew what I really did, he couldn't forgive me. If God knew that I actually kind of enjoyed uh, doing what I did, he, he wouldn't forgive me. Uh, if, if God saw some of the things that I had to do, uh, there's no way he can forgive me. See, they have that repentance. They feel the remorse. They understand that what they're doing is not right, but they don't have the belief that goes with it. By the same token, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest pitfalls for uh, the Lutheran Church and its emphasis on the salvation by grace through faith is that sometimes we forget the repentance. We just do the believe part. Uh, you know, we may all know, you know good Lutherans who, um, you know, I can do whatever I want. I can go out on, uh, I can go out Friday night and Saturday night and, and uh, do whatever I want because I'll just come to church on Sunday and I'm forgiven. Uh, it's not going to stop me from doing it. Um, churches often have people that are in the midst of living in sin uh, in, some, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, a couple that's cohabitating or uh, uh, homosexual couples or uh, um, what have you. Somebody who's, somebody who's embezzling funds from work uh, and, uh, and doesn't see anything wrong with it. Uh, you know, pick, pick your poison. I picked some of the, the obvious, the low-hanging fruit, but there's, there's more to this too. Whatever that sin may be, um, it's very easy for us to come and say, oh yes, I believe that my sins are forgiven, but I'm not going to change what I'm doing. I, I believe that it's, you know, I believe that this extramarital affair I'm having uh, with my coworker is wrong, but doesn't mean I'm going to stop it. Uh, I'm just going to come to church every Sunday and believe that I'm forgiven, but I'm not going to have any kind of repentance, you see. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, calls that cheap grace, uh, and it is. Um, uh, disciples are called to have discipline. When, when you understand the depth of, you, you would never, you would, when you understand the depth of God's grace, you don't treat it so cheaply. Um, but instead you want to, uh, you want to do everything you can um, to try to live a life worth, worthy of that price that Jesus paid for you and for me. Uh, and yet we still have those people. Uh, yeah, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, doesn't mean I'm going to repent of my sins. Doesn't mean I'm going to change. Doesn't mean I'm going to do as John the Baptist declares. I'm not going to do works in keeping with repentance. I'm just going to come and keep confessing the same sins and being assured of my forgiveness uh, and enjoying and enjoying the benefits, the benefits of, of my sin. Um, see, if you have, if so you can do one without the other. Um, but when, when we understand this fully, the two are joined together. We repent and we believe. We feel sorrow for our, for our sin, but we also feel the joy of God's, of God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ our Lord. We confess what we have done, but we also receive the pastor's absolution uh, in forgiveness for what I have done. And we understand that my sin, even though my sin is terrible, God's grace is larger. And because God's grace is larger, I want to go out next week and I want to live a life worthy of that grace, but I don't. So I come back and I confess and I receive absolution again. The two have to go together. If we separate them, then we're not doing things properly. And we don't have, I hesitate to say we don't have the true Christian faith, but that's kind of my initial response. And, and maybe that opens a can of worms, but that's just kind of my thought uh, right now. All right. Question 178 on the top of the second page. How are repentance and faith enabled by the good news assurance that we are accepted by God? Okay. How are they enabled by the good news assurance that, that we are accepted by God? I covered that earlier when we talked about the check. Um, when, when, you, when we know that God's default response to our confessed sin is forgiveness and not punishment, um, see, now we're able to repent more. When we realize that uh, when we are assured of the good news, when we know that every time we confess our sins on Sunday morning in corporate worship, and we know that the pastor is going to turn around and, um, and announce forgiveness for our sins, it makes us more likely uh, to do that. Um, you know, the pastor is never going to turn around and say, 
yeah, you're right to confess your sins. You, you're a bunch of terrible people. You've got to go out and do better before I'm going to give. No, that's no pastor is going to do that. Um, uh, these are things that are enabled. Uh, these are things that are enabled by God's grace. Oh, I had a technical glitch. Um, there's, a, there's an ancient collect in our church, and it's not just, we don't use it just in our Lutheran church, but I, I found that it's, uh, it's used in a lot of other uh, older mainline uh, um, uh, denominations as well. Uh, and I, I had it up, and then I had some computer problems, and I had to restart, and now I've lost the page. So, um, But the collect says, you know, it says, you know, Almighty God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray. Uh, and I've, that, that line has always struck me. And you can certainly take that line and apply it to forgiveness. Oh, Almighty God, you are always more ready to forgive than we are to confess. And when we understand God's desire to for, forgive, when we, when we understand that deep in our heart, it makes, us, it, it makes us more likely to confess. When we understand that God wants to forgive us uh, and uh then it's going to make us more likely to to confess. Um, uh, that's how that's how uh, these two go together. Okay. Next paragraph on our handout. Most scholars believe that Mark traveled with Peter as his uh, scribe and assistant. So they think that uh, as Peter was doing his apostle stuff, there was a man named Mark who uh, who kind of uh, wrote down Jesus' story and and captured it. The Gospel of Mark is seen as Peter's eyewitness account, so it appropriately begins with the call of Simon Peter and his brother Andrew to be fishers of men. We're going to talk about that call of the first disciples here. Uh, so go ahead and pause the video and take a look at the next three questions, uh, 179, 180, and 181, and then we'll come back and discuss it. Welcome back. Question 179 asks, how is it that these men were immediately ready to leave everything at once to follow Jesus? You know, this is the, this is the question that I often get asked in, in, uh, in Bible studies because, and again, I'm going to get on this high horse real quick, because we do you a great disservice by taking all of these gospels and chopping them up into pieces and not helping you see the full story. Uh, and this is one of those cases. So I've, I've, you know, I've read this text in a Bible study, and people are like, "Oh my gosh, Pastor!" I mean, um, we know. Uh, I think it's Mark's Gospel tells us that Peter was married because it talks about how Jesus healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law, and so if he has a mother-in-law, that means he's got an in-law, which means he's got a spouse, and you know, uh, so. How in the world did these men just come along and, and Jesus would say, hey, come follow me, and the guys just drop their nets and go? I mean, didn't they have wives? Didn't they have families? Didn't they have to make explanations? Didn't they have to make preparations? And the answer to all those questions is yes. Um, and the answer to the question 179 is that Jesus didn't come out of the blue and ask them to come be fishers of men. Um, in last week's gospel, we talked about how these disciples, these first disciples, were were also uh, followers of John the Baptist um, when he was when John the Baptist was baptizing down in Bethany, uh, down in the southern part near the Jordan, um, and so being followers of John the Baptist, there's the there's the wonderful example of how Andrew and John the Gospel writer, two of the men mentioned here. Uh, Andrew, Peter's brother, and then also uh, John, James's brother, they're standing around talking to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist sees Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God. And they go and they search him out, and, and they have this conversation in Bethany. Then it says that Jesus wanted to go back to Galilee. Before that, he talked to Philip, and he talked to Philip and Nathaniel, and we had all of that. Um, so it wasn't as though John and Andrew left everything right then to follow Jesus. It wasn't as if Philip and Nathaniel left everything right then to follow Jesus. They may have said things like, you know, we want to come follow you or we'd like to follow you, but we got to, you know, we got to make some arrangements first. They probably came back from their discussions with Jesus and told their friends and family about what they had seen and what they had discussed and how we think this is going to be the Messiah. And I have to think that some of the wives and such would be supportive to say, oh, the Messiah, the promised son of God, the savior of the world, you... He wants you to go and follow with him and start. Absolutely. Um, 
Absolutely. Uh, I, I saw this a, a lot a few years ago when I was at seminary because uh, uh, even when I was at seminary, almost uh, probably close to 50% or more of our class uh, are what we call second career guys. And these are guys who went through college, got some other degree, went into the working world, kind of, you know, worked there. Some of them had worked for, um, you know, 5, 10, 20 years. Uh, and then, and then after, you know, after 15 years of a normal life, they come to their family and they say, I think I want to be a pastor. And a lot of those families are very supportive, even though it means selling everything, uprooting the family, going back to a student life, uh, having a really tough time making ends meet, uh, for, uh, you know, for three or four or five years while you're studying to do that. Um, you know, and then leaving it up to chance as to where your first call is going to be and then all the uncertainty of that life of ministry. But there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of families that were very supportive of that decision because they knew how important it was to have pastors. And I, got, I, I like to think that those disciples who had families, it was the same thing. That when they were presented with this opportunity to travel with the Messiah and to learn in his feet for however many years, they didn't know it was a three-year ministry, um, but that they were excited and enabling. But again, it's not something that came out of the blue. It's not like uh, Peter, you know, left for breakfast. He went out to work on the nets and Jesus says, come follow me. And Peter doesn't come home. Well, did what happened to his wife? Where did he abandon his family? Where did he go? I'd like to think that they talked about it. Okay. Question 179 reminds us this didn't happen out of the blue. Uh, John tells us the story. John the gospel tells us the story about how John the Baptist uh, prepared these men to be disciples of Jesus. All right, question 180. What three elements or emphases come together to make up the call that Jesus extended? And what do them say to e what do each of them say to our lives um, as his disciples? So again, three parts to this. Follow me. I will make you become fishers of men. Follow me. I will make you become fishers of men. Okay. So, uh, so what does that mean for us today? Those are the, what are the emphasis, emphases of what that means? Well, first of all, follow me. Jesus is asking us to make his, his priorities, our priorities to make, uh, uh, to take part in, in his kingdom, to support his administration. Uh, an administration that is found on, founded on grace and mercy, uh, forgiveness, uh, and all of those sorts of things. That's what he calls us to do. Help me to tell people about that check that they have. Um, you know, you're not selling anything. They don't have to buy what you're shoveling. You're helping them to realize what they already have through the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what he calls us to do and to be. Um, so follow me. Likewise, we're not going any. This is this is not go for me. This is follow me. If we're following Jesus, it means we're going with Jesus. We're not necessarily going for Jesus. We are not in the place of Jesus. No one can be in the place of Jesus. In fact, we celebrate the fact that Jesus is the is in the place of us. That when Jesus is there on the cross being punished for sins, he's not being punished for our sins. Or if he's not being punished for his sins, he's being punished for our sins. He is in our place. So we don't go in place of him. He has already come and died in place of us. That's the message that we share. Again, and it's, it's, it's an invitation to follow me. Not go for me. Not go figure it out. Follow me. Second part, I will make you become. Not, I will show you the seven-step process to become. Not, I will teach you the way that if you apply it to become, I will make you become. I will make you become fishers of men. And I, I want to look at my Greek here real quick. Forgive me. Uh, na, 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 17. Yeah, I will make you become. Um, he makes us into this. His Holy Spirit shapes, molds, guides us into this role. Um, it's not something we make ourselves into. Uh, it's something that, that we are made into. 
Um, uh, we talk about when we, as we prepare young men for the ministry, we talk about pastoral formation, not pastoral education. There is some pastoral education that goes on with it, but mostly they talk about pastoral formation, that you, that you form a pastor, you shape and you mold him. And that's exactly what Jesus says here too, that he will make us, he will shape us, mold us. He will make us to become. And then the last thing he says is, is uh, fishers of men. Uh, in my church in Tennessee, there were a lot of very active fishermen. And so, of course, it was my pastoral duty to, uh, to take up fishing as a hobby. Um, I don't do it nearly as much as I would like, uh, but I do get out a, a few chances and, uh, and do some fishing. And, you know, the thing about fishing is you don't catch a fish on every cast. Uh, you don't expect to catch a fish on every cast. Um, you know, not every, not every worm that you dangle on a hook uh, results in a fish. Um, so, you know, and even then sometimes you're trying to, uh, you know, sometimes you're trying to set the fish up. Uh, sometimes you might throw a certain type of lure to get them active and then you throw a second type, uh, that's going to really entice them to come out and, and bite. Uh, but the thing about fishing is that you don't always catch. If you did, they'd call it catching. Uh, that's the old joke. Um, you know, if, if they, if if you always caught something, then they would call it catching. But they don't. They call it fishing because you don't always catch something. And that's a good thing for us. Even, even for Peter, James, John, Andrew, uh, those first disciples, they knew this. Uh, sometimes you would go out at night and you would, and you would fish. And, and sometimes you would have a miraculous catch of fish, 153, as we read at the end of John's Gospel. Uh, and some nights you would come back and maybe you'd only have 15 or 20. And sometimes you might come back and not have a thing. Uh, you know, not catch a single thing. Uh, you know, one of the shows that I, I've watched off and on that I really enjoy is uh, the deadliest catch about all the crab fishermen up in Alaska. You know, and they'll set their they'll set their crab traps at certain points, and sometimes they come and they're filled with crab, and sometimes they come and they're and they're not. And it, it's the same bait, and it's the same you know, it's uh it's the same process, it's the same procedure, and sometimes it's successful, and sometimes it's not. That's the process of, of the church. That's just how it works. There is no, there is no pat formula uh, to grow a church. Anybody who tells you that there's a pat formula to grow a church is probably selling it to you. Uh, and I've paid out some money uh, to a couple of pastors to try to, you know, to get their pat formula for making sure that my church grows. And what I found out is that it's like fishing. Um, you throw some lures out there, um, you hope that you hope that people will bite at them. Um, you hope that they'll come to understand the forgiveness that is theirs uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. But in the end, it's not up to me. I can't, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ. And if I can't, if I can't reason it out for myself, I can't make a reasonable argument for someone else. If I'm not strong enough by myself to believe for myself, then I can't. I can't tell someone how to be stronger for themselves. It's a process of the Holy Spirit. And only the Holy Spirit um, is the one who gets these results. It's not up to us. Uh, we, are just, we are just fishers of men. Okay? Um, and that's what it says to our lives too, is that if we're doing something wrong, when I'm doing, when I, if I'm having a bad day fishing, I try switching bait. I try switching areas. I try, uh, I try switching to a lure. I try, um, you know, you try moving to a new spot. There's a lot of different things that you have to try when you're fishing. And it's the same thing when we're doing this thing called church. There's a lot of trial and error. Uh, nothing is, is going to work a hundred percent of the time. Uh, it just, it just doesn't work that way. We have to wait for the Spirit's guiding and blessing to lead us in, uh, in, in catching men. Final question, 181. What does it say about their mission that Jesus called ordinary, uneducated men to be his disciples and apostles? And what does this say to you about the work you may be asked to do in the church? So, so what does it say about their mission that Jesus called ordinary, uneducated men to be his disciples and apostles? Um, it reminds me very much of the words of uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, where Paul says that we have, this, we, have this, the, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from ourselves. And so, so what does it say 
um, that it's ordinary clay jars uh, that carry the, the treasure of the gospel is to show that the power is found in the treasure of the gospel. Uh, it shows that the, the mission of God will be accomplished through his power, not ours. Okay, The mission of God will be accomplished through his power, not ours. Um, now, don't take that the wrong way. Don't think that we can just sit back and sit on our hands or twiddle our thumbs or, or while away the days and say, well, you know, the Lord never really blessed us. Uh, no, that's that's not acceptable either. We still have to follow Jesus. We still have to go where he leads. Uh, we still have to keep on repenting and keep on believing. Uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we have to go where he calls us. We have to, uh, to use that metaphor from C.S. Lewis, we have to choose to get on the bus. Oh, well, the Lord never really put me on the bus. Um, it's not the way it works. But when God does accomplish his mission, it's not because we're such a wonderful church or we're such great people or because, uh, you know, we've spent the last uh, 947,000 days straight studying God's word or, or it has nothing to do with us. Um, it shows that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Um, and so that's the second part. So what does this say about the work that you may be asked to do in the church? Never sell yourself short. Never sell yourself short. Um, don't, don't, ever, don't for a second think that you don't have enough gifts to be used by God in his church. Don't for a second think that you don't have enough contacts, that you don't know enough people, uh, that you don't have enough places, that you, um, I, don't, I don't know how else to put this. Don't ever think that you don't have enough to be used by God. Uh, you can be. Uh, you will be. One of my favorite sayings is that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Peter and James and John and Andrew were ordinary fishermen. They were faithful fishermen. They were active in their synagogue. They were disciplined in their faith. They were active fishermen. They were faithful fishermen. But they were fishermen. And God used them so powerfully that here you and I sit 2,000 years later, and we know about the man who called them to be disciples because they passed it on to the next generation, and that generation passed it on, and they passed it on, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we have now received it, and it is now our job. It's our responsibility to pass it on to the next generation, to pass on that message of repentance and belief in the gospel, um, to continue to keep his church safe and to grow his church uh, with him as we follow him. All right? Well, I think that's enough for today. Uh, thanks for taking this time to join me and take this longer look at, uh, at Mark chapter 1. Uh, I really enjoyed being here with you today. And uh, so let's close our time with prayer and uh, enjoy the rest of our days. Let's pray. Dismiss us with thy blessing, Lord. Help us to feed upon thy word. All that has been amiss, forgive and let thy truth within us live. Amen. Peace be with you.